This podcast contains depictions of violence and abuse perpetrated against children, including sexual abuse and rape, as well as suicide, institutional racism, intergenerational trauma, and a bit of swearing. But there's also friendship, love, inappropriate puns, and general skullduggery. The survivors of Lake Alice want their stories to be heard. But do take care when and where you listen. Stuff Podcasts. Previously on the lake. ECT is an easy subject to sensationalise. It's quick, it's life-saving, it has much to recommend it. Well, he was so groggy and so knocked about that he couldn't even think what his complaint was. From Pop Sock Media and Stuff, this is The Lake, a podcast about the children of Lake Ellis. I'm Aaron Smale, and this is episode four, Days of Their Lives. <laughs> Normal is not an objective thing. It's decided on by quiet consensus within a culture, community or group of friends. And even though it's not usually defined out loud, everybody knows what it is. Normal is the standard, the typical, the expected. But what happens when your normal is terror? When survivors like Rangi and Tyran tell me about Lake Alice... They have this way of talking about the most outrageous things that happen to them, as if they're totally normal. For them, things like eating dinner, going to bed, or watching a movie, all came with the possibility of assault, or even torture. And they were expected to just go about their days, knowing their personal boundaries would be ignored or obliterated by the people who were supposed to be looking out for them. Normalcy and depravity became so blurred together that they were one and the same. And what's more, they knew they were on their own. No one was coming to save them. We're trying our best as kids to act normal because, you know, that's like normal shit for us. That's what we deal with every day to the visitors that were watching us. They were absolutely fucking horrified. They were. And some of them did ask. Are you, are you kids all right? You look a little bit bewildered. Here's what we know so far. Between 1972 and 1978, around 300 kids went through the Lake Alice Child and Adolescent Unit. There, they received experimental shock therapy, were given dubious diagnoses and medications, and were punished for every misstep, though their punishment was called treatment. But this list of terrible practices doesn't capture the everyday reality of the adolescent unit, which is what we're going to hear about now. So we've struggled a little bit about what to include and what to leave out here. We don't want to ambush you with details that will cause unnecessary distress. But we also don't want to leave out too much either, because then we risk minimising the extent of the abuse and silencing the victims again. So we've decided to leave that decision to you. You can skip this episode and pick up from the next one, and the story will still make sense. If you do choose to listen, please know there are explicit descriptions of sexual abuse and rape. So just be mindful about when and where you listen, and take care. Tyrone Marks and Rangi Whitcliffe were some of the first kids to land in Lake Ellis in 1972, and they were pretty much left to their own devices, whiling away the hours locked in the day room of the villa. Schooling was a joke. Here's Rangi. What was supposed to be schooling was making beer crates in the gardens with a school teacher, supervising us, a female school teacher, and they had little steel slots that we could slide the wood into, and then hammer them with nails to hammer them shut. I think we got 50 cents a week for that, Uh, but there was no schooling at all for me. One of the most well-known beer crates in New Zealand back in the day was from ABC, the Associated Bottlers Company. Yeah, so um, you you probably learnt how to to say A, B, C, so that's the only schooling. Yeah, yeah, with a hammer and a nail. 
Tyrone has a vague memory of one of the patients pretending to be a teacher just for something to do. I've heard about another teacher who was a paedophile. So yeah, the schooling was a joke. But even when schooling was properly introduced at Lake Ellis around 1974, it didn't exactly sound normal. Leonie, that's the girl with the evil foster mother, she told me about a time a teacher actually had a mental breakdown and joined them in the ward. It was pathetic. It was a sham. We, it was mostly self-led, which is pathetic in itself. Leonie arrived at Lake Ellis a year after the school was set up. When you think of these children drugged in the most absurd setting, trying to do correspondence. What is that even, that picture? Think about that. Oh, you had shock treatment yesterday. Are you doing not great in maths today? Oh, you, you can't really, you're not interested in geography. You're not really interested, are you? You know, I mean, what a joke. It was some um, crazy people that went out there, dangerous people. This is Sharon Collis. She was at Lake Alice as a 14-year-old too. Sharon didn't get on with her mother, and she'd run away from home quite a bit. On one occasion when she ran away, Sharon was gang raped. Sharon told her mother, but she didn't believe her. She was sent to Lake Alice a couple of months later, in mid-1973. The rooms had a door with a real small window in them, with a curtain across. Um, Because we used to have to go and clean up after others had had shock treatment, Um, just to clean up the mess on the floor and change the beds, vomit or urine, either vomit afterwards or just wet themselves. Yeah, it was pretty humiliating, having to clean up and knowing that we're going to go through it ourselves. You just didn't know from one day to another what was going to happen. Even at Lake Ellis, though, teenagers still found ways to be teenagers. Leonie remembers one night when she and some of the girls made a plan to sneak over and see the boys. It was an adventure, and I think we even put black makeup on our cheeks or something. <laughs> and we wore all dark clothes, and, and there was such a lot of excitement. It was just such the biggest thing. And went over and threw stones at the windows of the boys' villa. Some, I think, looked out or whatever. Um, And then we went back and we went to bed and we had had a great time. No one ran away. No one left the property. But it was a great adventure. A couple of days later, I remember a guard from Maximum Security. He said to me something to the effect of, did you enjoy your escapade? And I was shocked. And he kind of had a laugh, and that's when I realised that in actual fact, maximum security had watched us the whole time. But they hadn't told on us, because we went and we came back. But bad behaviour didn't usually go unpunished. There was a variety of um, punishments, proudhide injections for various different, well, for many things. If you got caught smoking, um, injections, seclusion room and ECT, those were commonplace, those were common threats. I think in my nursing notes, for example, the nurse writes, Leonie had the cheek to ask if she could watch TV, seclusion room threatened. Days of Our Lives and Young and the Restless were two very big programs in the world of the nurses in Lake Ellis. And if we interrupted that by being bored out of our brains, talking, giggling, almost just breathing some days, you would be punished. Like the time Leonie and the girls found some cigarettes and snuck into the toilets, where they were caught lighting them off the sanitary burner. I was given 21 days seclusion for that. Locked in a side room with a tiny window, a bed and a bucket to go to the toilet. A nurse came in every day and injected me. 
I have never known aloneness and abandonment like that. I knew in those hours and nights and days that there was no one, not one person that cared about me. And that nearly broke my spirit. On about day 15, a beautiful nurse who never stayed bought me in a book. She snuck in a book. Did you lose track of time? Yeah. I had no way to mark it. There was nothing to tell how many days. Day nine, day 10, day what, day, will they ever let me out? Being sent to solitary confinement was such a common punishment at the welfare homes that it was mundane. In many conversations with survivors, they don't even think to mention it. But there's a massive body of research that says solitary confinement is extremely damaging, both psychologically and physically. And those studies are based on adults, not children. But at Lake Ellis, solitary confinement was taken up a notch. Here's Sharon. One of our punishments was we were... Um, made to walk past a secure unit where they had murderers and mainly murderers and they had a cage an exercise cage outside the villa it was connected to the villa but it was outside and um, there'd be a patient in there and maybe one of the boys and we'd be made to walk past the watch boys locked in an exercise yard like a cage with adult patients from maximum security. So it was a real threat to us. You know, you don't behave, this is where you'll go. Sharon remembers going to dances in nearby towns with other kids from the unit, but she found it embarrassing. They were kids from the nut house. One of the girls wanted to escape, so Sharon and some of the other girls helped her take the shutters off the bathroom window to get away. It was either Karen or Sharon that took off. They got worse punishment when they're caught. I think she was found in Monganui and um, they were, they brought her back. We were made to give her a bath and had to cut her hair off. An ice cold bath. Her friends cutting her long beautiful hair. That was just so wrong. They made us do that to the others. You know, you just wonder why. They had a lot of control over you. Even in the periods where they weren't being punished, they lived under the constant threat of it. As well as solitary, there were peraldehyde injections and shock treatment. And it wasn't just Dr Leakes giving the shocks. The nurses had free reign to do that too. And some of the kids were really young. I remember seeing them bringing in a little boy... He only looked about eight or nine, but we heard him coming over to our villa. Um, he was being carried by someone, and he was screaming. And um, they took him down the back, and they brought him out later on, and eventually just dragged him out in his underwear. So he'd had shock treatment. The ECT machine was purposely moved from room to room as a reminder to the kids not to play up. I mean, it was a portable machine, so it could go anywhere. You know, sometimes you'd even have that machine in the dining room at mealtimes. So that threat was always there. And it wasn't an empty threat. Here's Rangi talking about one mealtime, when a kid was brought in in front of them. To punish him, they brought him down into the dining room in the morning while we were having breakfast. They whirled in the fucking ECT machine... They put him up on the table in front of us. They wrapped his penis in a soaked rag, 
like a so in a soaked it in a solution. It was like a um, bandage, and they wrapped it around his penis and around his legs, and they attached the electrodes to his penis and to his rectum, and said, "This is what's going to happen to you boys that get caught masturbating," and zapped him in front of us. Yeah, the scream was horrendous. But breakfast was over for us. We had to sit there. We weren't allowed to move. They brought other stuff in to make sure that we didn't move. He went on later in life to have been just a pedophile. Peraldehyde was meant to be a treatment, but it was used as a punishment, a lot. Peraldehyde is like the equivalent of what parents do now with time out. Here's Leonie again. Like, you just get it frequently when you're trying to modify a child's behaviour. Proud of height was just dished out. Um, it's a thick syrup. It's very painful to inject. It hurts like hell. And the stench just oozes out of you. It stinks. You can walk past someone and you can tell they've had proud of height. If it's in your arm, if you injected it in your arm, it would hurt so much to lift your arm. You'd just be in this zombie, defenceless state. And in that state, the kids were expected to take part in group therapy. Sharon wasn't too keen, and so Dr. Leakes tried another method to get her to talk. I wouldn't cooperate. It would have been within the first six weeks that they gave me some stuff to make me talk out there. Leeks gave it. Stuff that makes you talk. Um, It's like a truth serum thing. I can't remember the name of it. Truth serum sounds like something out of a James Bond movie, but there were drugs that were used to make people talk. Barbiturates like amobarbital. They had a sedative hypnotic effect, and they were given to patients sometimes by psychiatrists who wanted them to open up about repressed memories. The nurses took me down to a side room in our villa and um, they tied me onto the bed. And they went out and Dr Leakes came in and um, gave me an injection in my arm. And I woke up and um, with my clothes in that disarray. I just asked what the fuck you were doing. And he put me back to sleep. Rangi had run away and been brought back to Lake Ellis and was given a vicious dose of ECT and knocked out. I come to you the next day and I'm strapped with leather straps down on our bed in a villa. Anyway, this patient comes, he's on a wheelchair. He goes, oh, you're in Villa 8? Because everybody knew that Villa 8 was full of psychos. He's been left in Villa 8 and tied down to a bed face down. This was an adult ward that housed some of the most aggressive and dangerous people in the country, outside of maximum security. Rangi didn't know what had happened to him when he was unconscious, but he soon found out. I'm like, fuck, what's wrong with my ass? And like, I'm itchy, it's on fire. And uh, I said, oh, can you undo the straps? He said, yeah, and I asked him, fuck. I could ask this all. And I went to scratch. I went to have a feel on scratch. And I felt a string there. I thought, what the fuck's that? So I yanked it. I didn't know. And, oh, fuck, the pain was unfucking believable I just screamed. And uh, he told me, he said, oh, after the shock treatment, they stripped you on the bed and all the fucking patients raped you. There was about eight of them. A senior staff member came to Rangi. He goes, I'll come to check your stitches. Rangi didn't even know he had stitches. Guess you I stitched you up last night. And because you'd been sodomised and split open. I didn't know what those words meant at that time. Remember that? You're talking about a little boy that's, that's got a burning ass and I'm sore and I want to get the fuck out of that villa. He knew everything about my injuries. He told me to my face that he stitched me up. On reflection, I 
am just astounded and appalled and disgusted to a point of extremities, really. This is Leone again. One, that children were even on that property, on that estate, in that place, because it was a little place of its own. There was maximum security, so that's where the most criminally insane people in our country, Maos, were housed. They'd been on good behaviour there, and now they were allowed to be in our villa. We all sat in the same room. We dined in the same room. These men and adults had full access to the small bunch of young girls. Not just in the dining room either. Adult men also had access to the children during small theatre productions and movie and game nights. So there was a hall in the complex and they would have bingo nights or movie nights once a week. Patients from the entire place would turn up and you'd have adult male patients from other villas and your villa and and some of these were pretty big, strong men. They would constantly be trying to get the girls and the boys to just come over here, come over here. We would have to go to Housy, hey, and win some smokes. Big night out. Housy's like bingo. You sit there with your ticket, waiting for the caller to call your numbers out. I remember, you know, we were 11, 10, 11 years old. <laughs> yeah, here we are in a room full of fucking nutters. <laughs> got to be careful, got to hold your bum a butt and fucking, you know, squeeze your way around. And uh, but, then, but then you've got to win the house. And when you do it, it's like fucking smokes. All of us, oh, I'm out that door, ah, back in for the next house. <laughs> fucking loved it, yeah. You're talking about 100 and something fucking people in the same room in the gymnasium doing fiddle on the roof. We know the odd play was put on at Lake Ellis, but we're not sure if Fiddler on the Roof is one of them. It's one of those occasions where Rangi goes sideways and uses puns about paedophiles. We do know that Rangi was a little boy who scanned his environment for predatory men. And looking around on these nights, there were plenty of them. I had uh, more than one occasions where I'd see these people coming and, and I knew they were coming for me and on previous occasions I'd run away from them. They caught me and beat me up and sodomised me anyway. But I got to a stage where um, I'd be playing soccer and I'd see them. I'd just go straight into the bush, down the trail, and let them have their way and and up with the pants and back into the soccer game. I, I just needed this over and done with it so I could go with my friends and play soccer. I don't want to get too wild out that day. It was actually the most you know, diabolical thing that could possibly happen to a human being. Um, I don't want to go into that area. I'm, I'm more inclined to go, no way I'm going to happen. I'm still alive, I'm still talking about it. It gets to a stage where it is normalised because it's part and parcel of what you're surrounded by, your environment that you're brought up in. For me, it was normal to have these people do this to me. I recall one time, so there was many people in the hall. I think it was a bingo night, and and so everyone's in the hall. Someone pulled back the red drape curtain on the left side of the hall, and this teenage boy was violently raping a girl from our villa from behind, and she was bent over and just so drugged, just stared out at us. And he, even seeing us all in a ghast looking, didn't stop. He didn't stop until the nurses dragged him off her. 
She was so defenseless. She was so drugged. This is probably a really strange question to ask, but I mean, you were drugged out yourself. Are you almost grateful that there's some things you can't remember? I know that as a 14-year-old girl, right up until I was 16, I was unsafe, I was unprotected. I was unprotected by the staff. I was unsafe with the staff, with the patients. I know that all of the children were susceptible to being abused, molested, raped. My choice is I have no recollection of that taking place and I choose to not go looking for any memory that I may have of it because the reality of what I do have is enough. There was a girl that I liked. I considered her a girlfriend, I suppose. Someone that I spoke to and I quite liked her. I went on well, so she had Down syndrome. And uh, but anyway, we we there was a girls' villa next door to ours. And it was before they guilt built the real girls' villa. It was just a villa, and we climbed up the fire escape one night to go and see her. And just me and my mate Chris and yeah, we looked through the window up on the fire escape and. The staff were raping her and photographing her. We sort of, oh shit. So we went back to our rooms, went to sleep. She was um, released and then committed suicide. I don't know if, if anyone else knew what went down with her in there. Yeah, I, I, um, I started shutting down pretty much after that. Although there have been spates of media coverage about Lake Ellis, from the 1970s up to the present day, the public has never been told the full story, and we've only heard from four survivors in this episode. Four out of around 300, probably more actually, given how many records were lost and destroyed. I've been researching Lake Ellis for nearly five years now, and I still don't feel like I've got to the bottom of what happened. But at this point, we know enough that should we fail to stand up for these kids, to demand justice and accountability for what happened to them, we are complicit. All of the children of Lake Ellis, all of them, have seen things we should never have seen, have seen things that parents wouldn't allow their children to see now. You wouldn't, if you could make this a movie, you wouldn't let your children watch it. You wouldn't. And yet we lived in it. And we were forced to experience it. We couldn't get out of it. In the next episode of The Lake, the children of Lake Alice grow up and try to get on with their lives. So when you got caught, what happened then? Oh, uh, they took us out for ice cream and cake. What do you think? <laughs> but the institution follows them. And I thought I was in trouble. I thought I was going back to Lake Alice again, to be honest. I was just about ready to run, and then this police officer turned around and said, they will come to question you about what you've been through. I was 16 years old. I'm watching bodies go past in a gurney in one of the hardest blocks in New Zealand. And a girl who had always frozen decides to fight. They're standing by me on that process of getting justice gave me the longest sense of having value. So someone standing up for you? It was huge. It was the first time in my life. The Lake was researched and hosted by me, Aaron Smale. It was produced, edited and scripted by Kirsten Johnston and Melody Thomas at Popsock Media. Tyrone Marks helped support survivors during our interviews. 
Ben Lemmy wrote music for the series and recorded the narration. Mark Chesterman did sound design and the final mix. At Stuff, our script advisors were Eugene Bingham and Adam Dudding, and the commissioning editors were Carol Hirschfeld and Patrick Crudson. This podcast was made with the support of New Zealand On Air.